Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Bill Barker, the director of the Center for Faith and Inquiry here at Gordon College. And it is the, my delight to welcome all of you to the second of three events in the annual Herman Lecture Series on Faith and Science in honor of Dr. Robert Herman. Now, for those of you who were not here yesterday, we welcome you today and just remind you that Dr. Robert Herman, in addition to being an instructor of uh, medical school students for 22 years, was also the founder of the American Scientific Affiliation, of which there are many members here today, uh, and an esteemed colleague of Sir John Templeton uh, Foundation, uh, which is the uh, supporting body for these uh, lectures here today. And once again, it is our delight uh, to welcome the highly esteemed Dr. Robert Herman, his wife Betty, and members of their family. Uh, so thrilled for that. Can we just have a round of applause for Dr. Herman and Betty? <laughs> Additionally, uh, on behalf of Gordon College, I would like to warmly welcome two prominent and venerable guests from McKenzie University in Brazil. Uh, President Jose Ramos and Dr. Solano Nato, we are so honored and pleased to have both of you with us. Thank you for being here. So yesterday we had a wonderful lecture from Dr. Jennifer Wiseman about how our universe inspires both wonder and praise. We also heard a very well articulated and salient response by Dr. Leslie Wickman. Uh, and as I noted yesterday, it is fitting to say that we receive lectures and responses from our speakers that maybe are best described, since we're dealing with the cosmos, they were, could be described as, as stellar lectures that were provided. It's a truly out of this world presentations. So today, uh, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman will speak to us on the unfolding majesty, a cosmic journey from light to stars to planets and life. And the response will be given by one of Gordon College's distinguished visiting scholars for the 2016-2017 academic year, Professor Ian Hutchinson of MIT. Uh, following their lecture and response, if we have time, we will hold a brief question and answer session. So before we begin, please allow me to share with you briefly uh, about these two distinguished speakers today. Uh, as I said, our respondent for today is a Gordon College distinguished visiting scholar from MIT, Professor Ian Hutchinson. Uh, now, what I should communicate with you about Professor Ian Hutchinson beyond being a wonderful uh, orator and from what I understand from his colleagues, a wonderful singer. Uh, he, of course, is also uh, the professor of nuclear science and engineering at MIT. He is an international expert on the physics of plasmas, the ionized fourth state of matter. He led the design, construction, and operation at MIT of a forefront plasma confinement experiment one of the nation's three major fusion uh, research facilities. In addition to 200 journal articles and two science textbooks, he has also written and spoken widely on the relationship between science and Christianity. We are thankful for Professor Hutchinson's friendship and service with us as a distinguished visiting scholar this year. Professor Hutchinson, we welcome you as well. And on to our keynote speaker uh, for the Herman Lecture Series this year, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. As we noted yesterday, Dr. Wiseman is an astronomer, author, and speaker. She studies the process of star and planet formation in our galaxy using radio, optical, and infrared telescopes. And she has worked with several major national observatories. She is also interested in national science policy and public science engagement. And she directs the program of dialogue on science, ethics, and religion for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Among her many other accomplishments, she discovered Comet Wiseman Skiff in 1987, served as a Jansky Fellow at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, was a Hubble Fellow at the Johns Hopkins University, and a Congressional Science Fellow of the American Physical Society, working with the staff of the Science Committee of the United States House of Representatives. She is also a Fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation. Dr. Wiseman is currently a senior astrophysicist with NASA. She has authored several essays addressing the relationship of astronomy and faith, and she frequently gives talks to churches, schools, civic, and campus groups on the excitement 
of scientific discovery. And just one of my favorite things uh, about the biography we received from Dr. Wiseman was how she noted that one of her favorite parts uh, of astronomy is actually simply going out in the evening and stargazing, uh, which is a, a wonderful reminder to us all of her lecture yesterday on how the universe inspires uh, both uh, praise and awe. So please join me in welcoming to our stage here once again, Dr. Wiseman. Thank you. My pleasure. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to be here at Gordon College and to take you all on a little tour through the universe. We did this last night or yesterday afternoon through the portals of thinking about beauty and activity. Uh, and we'll do that a little bit tonight as well. But I also want to open your eyes a little bit more to the idea of progression in the universe, to how the universe has unfolded over time and how we know that using telescopes today. So um, with that introduction, let me show you a little bit. We're, we're going to cover some of, the, uh, some of the material from yesterday in case you missed it. I'm going to show some of the nicer images again uh, this, this afternoon to get you back into the, the mood of thinking about the beauty of the universe. So um, here, again, is this majestic cluster of stars, Omega Centauri. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, I want you to realize that this clustering of stars is so crowded that if we were to look at it through a telescope on the ground, having to look through our Earth's atmosphere, all the light would get blurred a bit, and so you would basically see all the light blurred together. But by using a very good telescope, in this case the Hubble Space Telescope, which is orbiting the Earth above our atmosphere, you can actually differentiate star from star, even in a crowded region. The resolution is so good. And this allows one to see that stars are not all the same. They're spectacularly beautiful, different colors, different brightnesses. If our sun were in this cluster, it would look like one of these smaller whitish stars, one of these... Uh, average or, or slightly larger than average stars in the cluster. So um, there are a lot of stars and they are spectacularly beautiful and scientifically interesting as well. I want to just review a few of the examples I gave yesterday on the beauty and activity of the universe. We can study the universe in many ways and what I'm talking about in these lectures is astronomy using telescopes to study deep space. But let me pause for just a moment and bring us a little closer to home where in our own solar system there are other ways also of exploring space, including uh, probes that we send to other planets and so forth. And close to planet Earth and within our environs of, of the moon and so forth, we can actually send astronauts. And uh, I bring this up because um, there I am with, whoops, Dr. Mark Shellhammer who is um, the, uh, most recently the uh, chief scientist for NASA's human research program. There he is right there. And he has done NASA-related research for his whole career. He's a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He's also my spouse. And so I had the privilege of flying with him on one of the facilities that Mark uses to, uh, or, or that NASA uses to help understand what happens in weightless conditions. Um, this is, is, is called um, microgravity research. And in this case, it's conducted on an airplane that flies up and sort of simulates space conditions by free falling over and over again. So it climbs up and then it just falls, but not all the way to the ground, thankfully. It pulls up and goes up and down. And during that free fall period, you experience basically weightlessness, and so you can do experiments for during those brief uh, periods of time. And, you, and in Mark's case, he would study how the human brain interpreted signals from your vestibular system uh, when you were in a weightless condition as a help to NASA understanding how astronauts adapt to space flight. And uh, one year, I got to be a test subject for these experiments. So um, there we are, floating around, um, during one of these free fall episodes in the airplane. The airplane has a nickname called the Vomit Comet. And uh, <laughs> I don't think it takes much explanation as to why that's the case. Uh, but this kind of research 
Um, it was a lot of fun, actually, and no, I didn't vomit. Um, but it's, it's an example of the many ways that humans are endeavoring to explore the universe. So in, in this case, it's with astronauts. In the case of telescopes, it's mostly without astronauts, although, as I mentioned last night, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, was launched by astronauts. It's in orbit around the Earth. It can study deep space far beyond where astronauts can go, and astronauts have returned to it several times uh, to uh, refurbish it, to refresh it, to repair and put in new instruments, and it's working very well today. So that's one of uh, several telescopes that astronomers use um, these days. So with that digressing introduction, I just wanted to mention Mark here. Let me go back to the beauty of the universe. So we learned yesterday that the universe is filled not only with beauty but activity, and often you see these things intertwined. Here's one of these active interstellar clouds and interstellar nebulae. You can see the beautiful colored gas because stars have recently formed out of that gas, and the powerful photons of light from the most massive stars are released back into the surrounding environment, ionize that gas, and that makes it visible to us in these colorful, uh, uh, in these colors. So we look at these colorful nebulae as astronomers, and we determine at that point that star formation must have happened and must have happened recently when we see these lit up colorful nebulae. Stars can continue to form. After the most massive stars form, the smaller stars can form in a more slow-paced fashion out of the remaining gas. So star formation is one of these active and beautiful processes continuing. We looked at several of these nebulae. We looked at the Orion constellation with a ground-based telescope here that covers a larger region of the sky, showing you many stars that hopefully are familiar to you if you have looked up at the night sky, especially in the winter, you'll recognize this constellation. But when you zoom in on one of those kind of fuzzy star regions with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see this kind of detail. Again, glorious, beautiful color, and the light of the region signifies that star formation is still active. Um, stars come and go. We learned that these interstellar clouds get carved out by the radiation and winds from young stars into these beautiful structures. Uh, here's the Horsehead Nebula again. We learned yesterday that clouds and um, uh, dust fill the volume of these entities held together by gravity that we call galaxies. A galaxy like this one can contain hundreds of billions of stars interspersed within these gas clouds and dust clouds. So many stars that the light, in fact, blends together. So we see the beautiful core of light in the middle of this spiral galaxy. And of course, looking closely in this beautiful image, you might see some background galaxies as well. We learned that our solar system is right about two thirds of the way out um, in our own galaxy, this is an artist's conception of the Milky Way, and our solar system being our sun and the planets that orbit it is just one star of many, and it's located around uh, near one of these spiral arms that we call the local or Orion arm in the midst of an active galaxy. We learned also that there's, uh, all evidence points to the, the idea that there is a supermassive black hole in the core of our galaxy, and in fact, in the core of most galaxies. And what we call really active galaxies have black holes that are actively um, not only accreting in material, but expelling material in outflowing jets. Um, these active galactic nuclei are quite spectacular. Our own galaxy is not going through that phase right now, but it would be spectacular if it were. And we learned um, that the universe is active not only in star formation, but in solar system activities. Comets are coming and going. This one's fragmenting. Our planets are active, their atmospheres are active. This is Jupiter, a beautiful image in visible light where you see the atmospheric bands, but also in ultraviolet light, you see the active aurorae on the poles of Jupiter uh, indicating an active magnetic field. We learned that young stars can actually expel jets um, as they're forming due to their own magnetic field. So we saw this bipolar uh, outflow from a young star forming buried in that central dust cloud there. Looks like a lightsaber. 
And we learned that old stars expel their own atmospheres as they run out of inner fuel. Here's where we're going to take a little different path <clears throat> now for this evening's lecture. This older star, which you learned yesterday, is called what? The butterfly, and you all who were here got to take home your own butterfly nebula picture, which I'm sure you have framed now in your rooms. This beautiful nebula is an example of what happens when a star runs out of fuel or starts to run out of inner hydrogen fuel. If you recall yesterday, I explained that all a star is is a ball of gas formed out of these interstellar clouds that fill galaxies. These clouds are pretty turbulent, so most of the time they simply stay in a gaseous form. But if you get a little eddy of gas in one of these clouds that's over dense relative to its surroundings, it can actually collapse under its own weight. Gravity is always trying to pull mass together. That's why we're stuck to the floor here, because the Earth's mass and our body's mass is pull, are pulling together. But turbulence and, thing, and, 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 and uh, processes like that are always trying to disperse things. But if gravity dominates, if there's enough mass, it will pull together. In the case of an interstellar cloud, if you have a clump of gas that's collapsing under its own weight, it will get very hot in the core. A lot of pressure will form in the core of that clump of gas. If the pressure is high enough, and if there's enough mass, then the hydrogen atoms, most of the gas is hydrogen, the hydrogen atoms in the core will start a reaction called fusion, where two hydrogen atoms fusing together will create products, which include helium atoms and light, photons of light. The light photons take a long time to f make their way out of this forming star, but eventually when the photons get out and they're visible, we call that the, basically the, the birth of a star. It's turned on. That's what a star is doing. It's a ball of gas that has a fusion reaction perpetually going on in the core. That's what the sun, our own sun, is doing. But eventually, the hydrogen atoms in the core of that star get uh, pretty thoroughly converted to helium. So you have a helium core. This creates an instability. You have shells around that helium core that include hydrogen. But the core has changed. In order to keep fusion going, you need helium atoms to start fusing. That creates an instability. The star collapses a little more. The pressure goes up. Then helium atoms can fuse. And they can fuse into heavier atoms as well. So if you start thinking about that periodic table that you've learned about in your chemistry class, you know that hydrogen is first, helium is next, and then you move on into um, other heavier atoms. Stars are factories which stage after stage uh, fusion in the core create these heavier elements. Eventually, the star, when it becomes unstable enough, will uh, start to peter out. And, and most stars basically cool off, but they go through a stage like this first where they release their outer atmospheres in quite spectacular ways. This is a beautiful uh, nebula. We think our own sun is probably uh, uh, going to burn out in this way. Um, if the universe is still operating as we are now, a few billion years from now, um, and it will be quite spectacular. I hope we will have found a new planetary home and developed space travel in that epoch so we can get away and look back at it safely. Bigger stars than our sun, however, as they start to run out of hydrogen in their core, they become unstable as well, but in a very... Uh, uh, violent way, the star will become so unstable that it will explode in what we call a supernova. And as we saw yesterday, this, the remnant of a supernova can be quite spectacular. This is the beautiful Crab Nebula, the remnant debris of a star that exploded a thousand years ago. The remnant uh, stellar core or object is called a neutron star. It's buried in the center here, not visible in this image. The different colors of gas here are representing different types of elements that were forged in that star or in the processes of the explosion. So we see things like nitrogen and sulfur, silicon, oxygen, uh, heavier elements, elements heavier than hydrogen that were forged in the star and in this process of supernova explosion 
This is key because it means that stars themselves are factories for creating heavier elements. And then these heavier elements get dispersed, just as you see here when the star dies. These massive stars live relatively short lives relative to the, 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 the lifespans of stars like our sun. And when I say life, of course these things are not alive as we know life, but their functioning period as, as stars, as stable stars, is relatively brief. The debris gets distributed into interstellar space, and then the next generations of stars forming out of these interstellar clouds will be seeded with these heavier elements. They'll have a higher percentage of these heavier elements. It turns out that there's been several generations of stars in our own, solar, in our own Milky Way galaxy that have come and gone. So our sun, in fact, is not a first generation star. It appears that our sun is, is, is maybe a third generation star. It has formed largely with debris from previous generations of stars as well as the interstellar uh, medium that preceded them. Here's another debris region from an exploded star. You see all the stars in this spectacular image, but you also see um, this purplish uh, region. This, this again is debris from an exploded star. We call it a supernova remnant. You can look at this gas anywhere in more detail. So just as a random example where that gas is circled, we can look at it in a different way. We can look at it spectroscopically. To look at something spectroscopically means you take the light but spread it out like a prism into its various component colors. Spectroscopists will do this to be able to see what kinds of light are being emitted from whatever it is we're studying. Is light being emitted in every color with the same uh, energy, or is light coming only from very precise frequencies or very precise wavelengths of light, which can indicate that it's being emitted from certain atoms and molecules that will only emit light at certain particular colors or wavelengths. This is that spectrum. So looking, just looking at that little circle of gas, a, a random sample of this supernova remnant, looking at it spectroscopically, we can spread out the light according to its color or its wavelength or its frequency. These are kind of uh, interchangeable terms that astronomers use for spreading out light. And at each color or wavelength, you, we measure how bright the light is at that point. So for most of the colors or wavelengths, there's not very much brightness, there's not very much light. But at a, at a few of these very distinct wavelengths of light, we see a lot of brightness, all right? So this is called a spectrum. And a spectroscopist will look at this and see the patterns in the spectrum. And they will know what kinds of atoms or molecules are responsible for emitting that pattern of light. And in this case, the spectroscopist would say, ah, we see the pattern of oxygen here. And we also see the pattern of carbon. That means that the debris from this exploded star included these heavier elements that were forged in that star or in the explosive process. Starting with hydrogen, the stellar factory created these heavier elements and then dispersed it into the interstellar medium. This is very interesting. It means the next generation of stars will still be mostly hydrogen, but will contain some fraction of the heavier elements in this interstellar gas. This also allows for not only stars to form, but for solid disks of debris to form around stars made of materials that can create, that can create solids, um, things like iron and silicon silicate dusts, and as we'll learn in tomorrow's lecture, those disks around stars of solid materials can coalesce into planets. We are now actively studying not only star formation, but planet formation, and planet formation is also a very active process in our galaxy, and it would not be possible if there weren't solid elements dispersed around stars from which planets can form. These interstellar clouds that are creating stars, which are forging these heavier elements, 
uh, fill galaxies, as I mentioned. And let me just remind you from last night also that our universe is enormous. It's full of galaxies. This is one, and our Milky Way looks something like this, if we could get out of it to take a picture of it. But as I mentioned last night, we now know there are billions of galaxies in the, in the visible universe. This deep field taken by looking at a, a region of the sky, which doesn't have many nearby stars, where light was collected for days and days with the Hubble Space Telescope, revealed thousands of objects, and each one of these little blips of light is a galaxy. There's a couple of, of nearby stars in the foreground, like this object, but almost every other little dot of light here, big and small, is a galaxy. Galaxies can contain billions of stars each, and some of these are spirals, as you can see. Some are more elliptically shaped. Some are closer. Some are farther away. This field of view is small. It's about the field of view of a soda straw. Covering the entire sky, you could imagine that extrapolation that we live in just an enormous universe filled with hundreds of billions of galaxies, each galaxy containing potentially hundreds of billions of stars. So our universe is enormous. The potential for the number of stars and possibly planets is also enormous. Um, the media was quite taken with this as well. The Huff Huffington Post uh, posted this headline. We're looking now at these galaxies in great detail. So astronomers are interested not only in the mind-blowing number of galaxies, but if they differ from one another. And in particular, if they differ from one another over time. Well, how would we know that? Well, some of these galaxies are more distant than others. This uh, galaxy, which you can hardly even see in this box here, but blown up here and again here, is one of these almost unnoticeable, very reddened galaxies. But it's important because it is one of the most distant galaxies we have ever seen. Um, so it is shining to us from a period long ago. Remember, it takes a long time for the light that's emitted from these galaxies to reach our telescopes. And the galaxies that are farther away, when they emit light, it takes even longer for the light to get to us than galaxies that are closer to us. And so in that way, astronomy is kind of like a time machine. We can look at the more distant galaxies and study them as they were at a more distant epoch of time and compare them to more nearby galaxies and see if they are the same or different. We now believe, scientifically, that the universe has not always been here in a stagnant, way, in a stagnant um, uh, type of existence. The, the astronomy community, about a century ago, many thought that the universe was steady state, meaning that it really hasn't ever changed. It's always been here, kind of like it is. But as telescopes got better and better, observing the universe, seeing galaxies, seeing that the universe actually seems to be expanding, it became clear that the universe has not always been here eternally in a steady state. It became clear that the universe had a beginning. And in fact, that beginning appears to be spectacular. Uh, a kind of joke term was coined um, in the early and mid part of the 20th century called the Big Bang because some scientists didn't believe that the universe could have an explosive beginning that had too many theological overtones. But in fact, most astronomers now look at the data from different kinds of observations and all conclude that our universe did have a spectacular beginning, a burst of energy that's really better described as a burst of inflation where the universe had very small size scales and then expanded in a tremendous way, and that began about 13.8 billion years ago. The fact that we can actually have that kind of precision is amazing. And we are now seeing baby galaxies that were just starting to form from within that first 0.8 of the 13.8 billion year history of the universe. These baby galaxies are very small. They are mostly hydrogen because the stars within them have our first generation stars or second generation. They haven't had a lot of time to develop these heavier elements. We can study these distant galaxies 
and compare their composition and their sizes to galaxies that are bigger and more nearby. It turns out that early galaxies, when the universe was more compact, had a habit of merging with other galaxies. Their gravitational pull would be strong. They would be pulled together, and these galaxies would become bigger. And so many galaxies today are the product of mergers of galaxies early in the universe. Our own Milky Way appears to be the product of at least one merger with another galaxy. And as I mentioned yesterday, we're on a head-on collision course with a merger in the future with the Andromeda galaxy. Um, so uh, that should be spectacular to watch in about, starting in about three billion years. So astronomy takes things on a time scale. How to, on a big time scale, studying these very distant galaxies is uh, fun but challenging because they're often very faint. So as I mentioned yesterday, astronomers can actually use a trick of nature to study some of these distant galaxies, and it is using gravity itself as a lens. This is an image of a cluster of galaxies. These yellow objects here are galaxies. Remember, a galaxy can contain billions of stars. Here, the light's all blended together from the stars, so you just see the, the, the combined light of galaxies. But it turns out that most of the matter in galaxies is not visible at all. Most of the matter is in a form that we would call uh, dark, dark matter. We don't really know exactly what it is, but it's a hot topic of study. Its effects, though, are understood. They, they have, dark matter has gravitational pull, just like any matter. And in fact, Albert Einstein predicted that mass actually distorts space. And so if you have a large amount of mass gathered together, it's going to have a large distortion effect on space. Now, nobody thought you should be able to actually see this effect, but, but they were wrong. We do see it now. It's called gravitational lensing. When you have a lot of galaxies held near each other by their mutual gravitational pull and all of their dark matter that you can't actually see, that mass has a significant effect on actually distorting and curving space itself so that when you're looking at more distant galaxies, farther away than the cluster, as that light is traveling through the cluster and around it toward our telescopes, it will get magnified and distorted. So that is what this is. This funny snake-like thing is a background galaxy. It's more distant than these yellowish galaxies, but you can see more detail about it. You can tell it's a spiral. You can tell more about it because it's being magnified by this lens, this natural lens, and it's also being stretched out and distorted by this lens. The distortion and the amount of it and how it's placed gives us a clue as to where the dark matter is distributed in the foreground cluster. So astronomers use this trick of nature, gravitational lensing, to study very distant galaxies and to understand what they're made of and to also study how dark matter is distributed in these foreground clusters by looking at the lensing arcs and effects from background light. Here's another cluster of galaxies that's, that's uh, lensing background light. You can see these funny blue-shaped arcs. These are all pieces of light coming from background galaxies, so clever astrophysicists will put their computers to work and model how this cluster of galaxies and how its dark matter must be distributed in order to create these funny distorted light arcs from background galaxies. So using our best telescopes to study the most distant galaxies that we can see, both by just straightforward observations and by looking at these magnified uh, lensing regions, we can now get a very interesting picture of the history of the universe. So I showed this yesterday, but as we're looking uh, at fainter and fainter objects, we can see deeper and deeper into space. This graphic is supposed to highlight how telescopes over time have, have gotten better. The telescopes are better, the cameras on board are more sensitive from ground-based observatories um, through several phases of the Hubble Space Telescope and other space telescopes. As, as they've been serviced repeatedly by astronauts, they've been uh, uh, given new cameras that are more sensitive. We're even looking toward a future telescope here, the James Webb Space Telescope, as these cameras get more sensitive, they can see fainter and fainter galaxies, which means you can see, in many cases, that means seeing farther away. 
And that's what these arrows represent, seeing farther into space. Well, it's taken longer for the light to get from these galaxies back to the telescope. So if you think about the arrows going in a different direction, you're looking farther back in time. And these are uh, earlier epochs of our universe. So the bottom axis here going from right to left would be from sometime right after the beginning of the universe, which would be off to the right here, and moving forward in time from right to left to our present time. And over time, the universe has changed. We're looking back now to an era where we see these very infant galaxies that are not well formed and are mostly made of hydrogen. And then as we look closer and closer to our own time, we see these better formed galaxies. They've merged with other galaxies. They've become larger. They've had time to form these beautiful spiral structures, some of them. And the compositions have changed. The galaxies back in this epoch of time, mostly hydrogen, the galaxies like our own in our epoch of time have had several generations of stars, these factories that have produced heavier elements like carbon and oxygen. And so we see mostly hydrogen still, but some of these heavier elements in and around stars as well in galaxies from our own epoch. So we see this progression um, of time and a change in galaxies over time uh, looking into deep space. Here's visually what this looks like. So taking some real images of galaxies out of the Hubble uh, ultra deep field and just kind of displaying them in a way you can see the differences. These galaxies are from closer to us in space and time. These are a little bit farther away, a few maybe, um, maybe two or three billion light years away. A light year is the distance that light travels in, in one year. So we're now seeing um, galaxies from billions of light years away, maybe one billion light years away, three billion, five billion, 10 billion, and now we're seeing some of these infant galaxies that are more than 13 billion light years away. And you see how they're different. Looking back in time, baby galaxies in our infant universe were small. And then as they merged and grew and many more stars formed in them, they became bigger and more mature like our own galaxy. Keep in mind that the nearest big spiral to our own, Milky Way, the, the Andromeda galaxy, is about 2 million light years away. So even when we look at our nearest neighbor, big spiral galaxy, it's taken 2 million years for that light to get to us. And now we're seeing galaxies that are billions of light years in the distance, distance and in time. So wow, this is great. Our, our telescopes are a time machine. Um, we can see that the universe has changed over time. And in fact, the generations of stars, beginning with the first stars that formed out of the first gas um, early in the universe, um, have created heavier elements that have enriched galaxies over time. Here's another way of looking at this. So flip it around in your mind, the beginning of time being over here, uh, which you might call that let there be light event or, or the Big Bang, however you want to call it, off to the left, a period of rapid inflation um, that caused the universe to grow in, in, unbelievable, uh, in an unbelievable pace right at first. And then when the, first, uh, when, the, when the universe expanded to the point where atoms could form as the universe cooled, you got the first gas, the first stars. Um, eventually, stars and gas coalesced into these regions we call galaxies, galaxies. Um, merged uh, uh, and grew over time. So this is going in the other direction from the last graphic I showed you, but it's also trying to show you here um, that the expanding universe, as we know now, the galaxies are actually moving apart from each other as space itself is expanding. That expansion is actually accelerating. So if you imagine this kind of graphical horn of the universe extrapolated as a sphere over the observer, if you were in the middle over here. Um, that's what's happening or what has happened over time in the universe, all right? in this case from time from left to right. So here's the whole history of the universe uh, right before your eyes. So what we're seeing is change, and not just change in random directions. We're seeing what I, would, what I think of as a progression, a maturing of the universe. The universe has developed over time. And it continues to mature and change with the production of stars, heavier elements, and planets. 
that provide conditions needed for life to thrive on at least one planet. So we are enjoying the fruits of these generations of stars in our own galaxy. The fact that we have carbon in our bodies, we're breathing oxygen, we have a solid planet that we can stand on, we're breathing uh, air, we can uh, touch this solid desk here. Um, that is a product of what we now can see with our telescopes having happened in the universe, progressing over time. This is quite incredible. Does it imply that there's been a purpose to the universe all along? That the universe had a purpose from the very beginning, from that burst of, of energy and inflation that began the universe as we know it, to the point now where we have life and we can talk about it and think about it and think about ourselves. Does that imply that the universe always had a purpose? Well, I have just jumped from the science, all right? This is what we're learning from our observatories, from our telescopes, and even our microscopes. This is philosophy and the theology. This is a different kind of question. Does the universe have a purpose? That's not really a scientific question. The Bible would say yes. In particular, it says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Um, that's a purpose of the universe, to glorify God. Biblically speaking, that's not a scientific statement, but it's certainly what the psalmist thought. And as I mentioned yesterday, this psalm points out that there's some knowledge, some message that comes without speech, without words from the heavens, and yet their words go to the end of the world. They're giving some kind of message. You don't have to glean purpose. As I, as I mentioned yesterday, um, scientists and others can look at the same data, the same information, and come to a different conclusion. Physicist Steven Weinberg says the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. So, uh, and, and that's, that can be a valid conclusion too, right? You can look at what's happening in the universe and be more puzzled than comforted by it. This was a wonderful little exercise that um, was carried out recently by uh, the, the Templeton Foundation, they asked several leading thinkers in our society, scientists, philosophers, and theologians, they asked the question, does the universe have a purpose? And each one of these uh, thoughtful people gave a response, a one-page essay. And so you can read their one-page short responses and their rationale behind their response if you go to this website at www.templeton.org slash purpose. I encourage you to do that. It's fascinating to see how different people looking at the same types of information we have can come to different conclusions. You'll recognize some of these uh, names here. Um, we have Owen Gingrich, esteemed professor of astronomy and history at Harvard University, saying yes, he'll be here tomorrow evening as our discussant. Um, we have other folks saying no, we have some saying not sure, Neil deGrasse Tyson. We say have Jane Goodall saying certainly. Uh, we have Ellie Wiesel saying I hope so. Now it helps to actually look and see why they say this. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples if this will allow me to do it, which is to um, go to that website <coughs> and click on some of these. So here's Owen Gingrich's response. He says, um, yes, the universe has a purpose. Frankly, I am psychologically incapable of believing that the universe is meaningless. I believe the universe has a purpose, and our greatest intellectual challenge as human beings is to glimpse what this purpose might be. All right, and you can read the rest of that on your own. Um, let's look at no here. Um, here's, a, here's a no response, if it will let me do this. Okay, whoops. No is not found. Okay, here we go. Oh, well, it's not in here. Hold on, patience, please. Um, all right, let's look at this one. Okay, so this is um, Peter Williams Atkins, who's a fellow and professor of chemistry at Lincoln College in Oxford. Does the universe have a purpose? He says, no. In the absence of evidence, the only reason to, to suppose that it does is sentimental, wishful thinking. And sentimental, wishful thinking, which underlies all religion, is an unreliable tool for the discovery of truth of any kind. All right? 
So uh, he goes on to say, and you, and you, sh and you should read all of this, but um, um, he basically says at the bottom, I regard the existence of this extraordinary universe as having a wonderful, awesome grandeur. It hangs there in all its glory, holy and completely useless. To project onto it our human-inspired notion of purpose would, to my mind, sully and diminish it. Okay, so that's a no. All right, let's look at Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, he's not sure. He says anyone who expresses a more definitive response to the question is claiming to access to knowledge not based on empirical foundations. Okay. But then he goes on in a quite interesting um, way to explain, to uh, talk about um, what the purpose of life would be. He says, how about human life itself? Well, first of all, he says, if a further purpose of the universe was to create a fertile cradle for life, then our cosmic environment has an odd way of showing that, um, meaning that for most of the history of the universe, we really haven't had intelligent life. But what about human life? He says, if you are religious, you might declare that the purpose of life is to serve God, but if you're one of the 100 billion bacteria living and working in a single centimeter of our lower intestine, you would give an entirely different answer. You might say that the purpose of human life is to provide you with a dark but idyllic anaerobic habitat of fecal matter. <laughs> okay? So um, you see there are different responses, and I won't go through all of these. Um, Jane Goodall says, absolutely, certainly, and she talks about her own understanding, um, and having grown up in a Christian family herself. So this, again, is a philosophical question. Does the universe have a purpose? Um, it depends on what you mean by purpose and who you're asking. Freeman Dyson looks at this progressive history of the universe and says that it would not be surprising to him if it should turn out that the origin and the destiny of the energy in the universe cannot be completely understood in isolation from the phenomena of life and consciousness and that the design of the inanimate universe may not be as detached from the potentialities of life and intelligence as scientists of his 20th century has tend, have tended to suppose. You know, this is coming to be more and more true because the more we uh, recognize this true, the more we're studying the universe and the more we're studying our own biology, we're learning two things. We're learning, first of all, that our bodies are many different organisms. We are what we call, we have what we call a microbiome. Our bodies contain many, many cells that do not have our own DNA, at least as many cells without our DNA as cells with our DNA. We are uh, multifaceted communities in, within our own bodies. So think about that for a minute. And then we find out that most of the atoms that make up these cells um, were forged in stars. We don't know any other way for them to um, have been created except through these furnaces of stars that I've talked to you about. So your very body is connected to stars in the universe. We are connected. Um, so was the universe intended to bring about life in this sort of progressive and, and maybe designed way? Uh, well, some would say yes, some would say no. Uh, French biochemist Jacques Monod says the universe is not pregnant with life, nor the biosphere with man. Man at least at last knows that he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe out of which he emerged only by chance. His destiny is nowhere spelled out, nor is his duty the kingdom above or the darkness below. It's for him to choose. All right? That is kind of a, a, a definite no to the answer of purpose uh, in his mind. Well, is the universe actually fine-tuned to be habitable for life? Is, can you actually see if there's some physical rationale for saying that the universe has some kind of purpose that you could measure through physical experiment? That is some of the conclusions come to by people who notice the universe seems, in some sense, to be fine-tuned for life. And I don't have time to go into all of this, but there are a whole range of fundamental physical constants that basically drive the physics of the universe. They are fundamental. They are the basis on which our physical laws operate. And for many of them, if they were the slightly, a slightest bit different than what they are, the universe would not have evolved and progressed in the way that it has in a way that could support advanced life. Um, one such example is the gravitational constant. 
this number, which dictates the strength of gravity, if it were off by even something like 1 times 10 to the 60th power, something very, very different, uh, very slightly different from what it is, we would not have a universe as we know it today. If, it, if the constant were slightly smaller, then the universe would have expanded way too fast for stars and galaxies to coalesce. Slightly larger, and the universe would have collapsed in on itself way too fast. So there's a whole list of these fine-tuned constants um, that can indicate possible purpose for the universe. Now, there's a debate about this. Is the universe fine-tuned for life, or could these fundamental constants actually have a large range in what we're seeing as kind of an illusion? Or is it that, yeah, we do live in a universe where these constants are just right for life, but that's kind of an accident because there's many, many universes. There's an idea of a multiverse, all right? The idea being that maybe our universe that began 13.8 billion years ago is just one of many, that there's a fundamental um, uh, situation going on even before our universe began that allows bursts of energy somewhat randomly to pop off new universes. And these other universes could have different fundamental constants. Many or most of them could have no capabilities of life. We just happen to be in one that does have constants that allow life. Now, the multiverse theory is popular, and in fact, it's uh, something that comes out of string theory as well. So it's, it's a, a theory that has uh, some good basis, but it's very hard to do any measurements. We can't see outside our own universe to see if there are other universes. And so we can't really prove this theory. And even if we are in a multiverse, which I actually think would be fantastic, but you still wonder why are there initial conditions that would create a multiverse? So that capital W why question, which is outside of science, would still remain. Christian de Duve, biochemist and Nobel laureate, said that in his opinion, life and mind are such extraordinary manifestations of matter that they remain meaningful, however many universes unable to give rise to them exist or, po or are possible. Diluting our universe with trillions of others in no way diminishes the significance of its, our universe's, unique properties which I see as revealing clues to the ultimate reality that lies behind. There is our own visible universe, what we can see, this fraction of it from the ultra-deep field. It does beg some tough questions, though. What will the long-term future of our universe hold? As I mentioned yesterday, we've discovered that not only is the universe expanding, but that expansion is accelerating in incredible ways. Um, if this continues, the expansion, without any slowing down, the universe will cool. Uh, the stars will eventually use up all of their fuel. They will eventually all die out, and everything will go dark. Um, what are we to think of that? Is that really the only prospect for the future of the universe? Now, as, someone, as a person of faith, I would say there's more to the story than that. There is a promise of hope, but that's a different uh, approach. Um, and then we discussed a little yesterday, but are we significant, given, the, given this vastness of the universe in space and time, and even this possibility of a multiverse? Does that make our individual lives insignificant? Well, if we measure significance in terms of our time and space in the universe, our place in the universe, our lifespans, then... Um, indeed, uh, we aren't significant. This builds on uh, the whole Copernican revolution where we found out that Earth was not in the center of the solar system, and now we know that our solar system is not in the center of the galaxy. Our galaxy is not in the center of the universe. There may be other universes. But not being central or un even unique as life forms um, does not necessarily have to be interpreted as being insignificant. A rarity ne doesn't necessarily correlate one, one way or the other with significance. And I will just point out that um, Dennis Danielson, as a professor of, of literature, wrote an article in the American Journal of Physics where he pointed out that in Copernican times, being removed from being the center was often considered an elevation, not a demotion in your importance. So when we look back and think about how being removed from the center is somehow giving us less significance, that may not be the way it was interpreted, at least back in Copernican times. 
Um, but I digress. Um, biblically speaking, if we take the word uh, of, uh, uh, from the scriptures about significance, we read that in fact... We are significant, not because of our position in space and time, but because of the will and the love of God. Psalm 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear and reverence him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust, and now we know that that dust is forged in stars. As for man, his days are like grass. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear in a respectful way him. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. So biblically speaking, it's God's love that gives significance. And as we pointed out yesterday, you can think of our place in the universe this way, with Carl Sagan saying, who are we? We find that we're tucked on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. Or you can think of our significance the way the psalmist did in Psalm 8 when he praised God, saying, How majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You've made them a little lower yet than God and given, crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over your, the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. The psalmist jumped from this feeling of insignificance by looking at our place in the universe to looking at what God has given us. He's given us a kind of glory in part because we have the ability to study nature. And that's how I view having dominion over the universe. We can't actually go to most of these places, but we can study it. I view science as a gift of God to understand the basics of how nature works, and it, for, in that sense, to have a greater appreciation of God. Um, I mentioned that this is not all easy, and I don't have time uh, tonight to go into these tough questions that I brought up yesterday, but if the universe has been progressing for life, um, what about all the troublesome parts? Why so much pain and suffering? Why do the same processes that planets entail to form and that our healthy planet uses to keep our atmospheres healthy like plate tectonics also cause pain death and grief like earthquakes um, how can this creation be so good and seem so bad at the same time and what about what we do to each other that, that that's that's hurtful humans to humans or even what we do to other creatures on the planet um, is this okay um, and, and i mentioned yesterday i would say not there is something um, that's real, that I believe is called evil, uh, which is a theological question, but all of us feel its impacts. And I will um, move quickly, but to say that the biblical perspective on addressing these for Christians is the incarnation. We don't know all the answers, but we know that somehow God becoming incarnate in human form with the body of a human, with cells connected to stars, just like ours, this, uh, this incarnate God has shown his care for us. Um, and in fact, it's the same God who's responsible for the universe. Um, Hebrews 1, 1, 2, 3, 1 through 3 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, and is sustaining all things by his powerful word. So here you have this fantastic picture of an interaction in a personal way between the God who's responsible for this vast universe of time and space and representing to God in, to us in a way that uh, we can relate to in a personal way. And that this God is still upholding the universe and that God we know as Jesus Christ. So let me close with a beautiful, inspiring image showing again that this progressed universe is now to the point where stars and planets continue to form out of interstellar clouds um, in beautiful galaxies. It can inspire senses of awe and wonder and praise. Um, I gave a talk um, to a university in Canada a, a couple of years ago, and one of the uh, students in the audience uh, was a woman from 
Iran, and she was very interested in art, and she believes spiral galaxies evoked a sense of dancing, and she created um, this image to her of basically the universe dancing in response to its beauty. Wonder, praise, music, um, poetry can all be inspired from looking at the universe. And uh, I think I'm out of time tonight, so I'm going to put you off one more night, as I did last night. But I have a little video that's actually discussing some of the inspiration that goes into places of worship as we think about this incredible universe and how it's connected to our lives and to our faith in God. The space window at the National Cathedral, the uh, images of the Hubble Space Telescope brought to, to, uh, to beauty in stained glass, at uh, St. Paul the Apostles Church near Johnson Space Center are examples. I'll show this little video about it tomorrow. Um, I pointed out some resources yesterday that I want to point out again. The Book of the Cosmos um, by Dennis Danielson, an anthology of literature from throughout history talking about how the universe relates to meaning and purpose as human beings. And then we've also mentioned tonight um, the American Scientific Affiliation and Network of Christians in Science. Um, the BioLogos Foundation really helps to understand how life and, and, and faith and the Bible can be seen together in harmony, biologos.org. And then a wonderful little booklet called When God and Science Meet, which I think is being offered on the back table outside. You can see a PDF of it at the website nae.net. If you like the images I've shown, you can go to this website. So I'm going to close there, but I would like us to uh, leave with a sense of praise. Um, it's amazing to think that we've been given the tools to see this progressive history of the universe that is now at a point where life can exist and look back and study the universe, study its content, um, even think about not only its past but its future and what our role is and that this can lead to a sense of wonder and praise. And so um, we praise God for the gift of science that allows us to explore and understand the wonders of creation. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I invite our uh, discussant to come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. Uh, a very thought-provoking lecture raises a number of questions for us, not only at the existential level, but also in terms of theodicy and our hermeneutic of virtue and, and, uh, and wonder and praise, among a number of other things. At this time, I simply would like to invite our distinguished visiting scholar, Professor Ian Hutchinson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wiseman, Jennifer, uh, for that beautiful explanation and, and depiction of the wonder of the physical universe. Um, the plasma physics that I spent my career um, studying um, is, is motivated more by more down-to-earth applications, including fusion, actually, um, than the pure fascination of understanding the universe that uh, is uh, represented by astronomy. But but still, I think my field actually describes a significant fraction of the phenomena of astrophysics. Um, and so I share and echo your sense of wonder and worship. And, your, and uh, I thank you for your presentation. For me, and, and perhaps for you, the appreciation of God's handiwork and the appreciation also of his love and saving power have grown together in my uh, career and in my life. And I was never convinced of the uh, idea of an intrinsic incompatibility between science and the Christian faith, so often assumed today. Um, indeed, on balance, they've always seemed to be, mm, to be more sort of brothers than belligerents. Um, but I don't think questioning um, how one's theological and physical understandings of the world, as you've, as you've brought them together today, um, is at all forbidden or dangerous for the faith. And I actually take seriously uh, the view of our Christian scientific forebears. 
that God has revealed himself in two books, the, the book of his word, the Bible, and the book of his works, um, the creation. And I, um, like those forebears, I like to um, and aim to interpret those two books, each in their own terms, in their individual terms first, not looking to the Bible for scientific description of nature, nor looking uh, to science for proofs of human spiritual realities. Um, but occasionally there are strains and tensions, I think, between those two books um, that arise in, in, in understanding the compatibility of our understanding of um, and actually our interpretation of those two books, the word and the works. James Clark Maxwell, who was arguably the um, most famous theoretical physicist between Isaac Newton and Einstein, uh, and who was, was also a committed follower of Jesus, talked about plowing up his faith. Um, and by that he meant critically uh, thinking it through in the light of modern knowledge, um, and discovering its intellectual foundations. And in his later years, when he was uh, really um, a public figure, famous public figure, he wrote with great wisdom in response to a question from the Bishop of Gloucester and Bristol. And the Bishop of Gloucester and Bristol br was wondering whether the creation of the stars after the creation of light in the first chapter of Genesis, could be harmonized by regarding the earlier light as being the luminiferous ether through which uh, Maxwell's electromagnetic radiation um, was in those days thought to pass. And Maxwell replied um, uh, rather wisely about the ether hypothesis as follows. He said, the rate of change of scientific hypotheses is naturally much more rapid than that of biblical interpretations. So if an interpretation is founded on such an hypothesis, it may um, act to keep the hypothesis above ground long after it ought to be buried and forgotten. And the point, the, 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 the irony of that remark is that in Maxwell's day, the ether was considered to be a reality, but it wasn't until about 20 years later that it became clear there is no such thing as the ether. And so Maxwell was completely right to say that one shouldn't couple those two together because it might have kept the ether above ground when it should have been buried. But the point I want to make about this saying or this uh, letter of Maxwell is that biblical interpretation rightly changes much more slowly than scientific knowledge. But nevertheless, it does change. Sometimes it changes because of improved literary uh, or linguistic scholarship or the discovery of new manuscripts sometimes because culture has changed and we need uh, um, uh, the Bible's message to be explained and emphasized differently. And sometimes it changes because of new theological insights, sometimes perhaps also because of new knowledge about the physical cosmos. And actually, we can see portrayed within the scriptures themselves, within God's word, um, a gradual progression of interpretation of God's dealings with his people. That's part of what Christians have historically meant when they talk about God's self-revelation in the scriptures being progressive. It's a pity that the word progressive has now been appropriated by the left wing in politics. I don't mean left wing politics here, of course. Um, so we should not be misled by anti-theological assertions that science um, experiences continual progress 
um, while theology is static. It's not true. Biblical theology is indeed slower to change than science, and it should be since we believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But biblical interpretation does indeed progress. So let's be straightforward then, I suggest, uh, in recognizing that the Old Testament writers and Christian readers, and everyone else for that matter, up until at least the 16th century, thought that the earth um, was stationary and that the sun and heavens revolve around it. Um, it took about a hundred years of growing evidence um, until it was established in the mid 17th century uh, that the Copernican view is right. And at that time, biblical phrases like Psalm 93, the earth shall never be moved, were gradually um, accepted to be what they always were, which is poetic expressions of the stability and trustworthiness of creation, not descriptions of Newtonian physics. And liberating the Bible from a literalistic straitjacket, which the schoolmen of those days who argued against Copernicus uh, would have condemned it to, is today accepted as an obvious vital step um, in, in natural and spiritual interpretation. So I'm happy to concede, in case it wasn't obvious already, that there's substantial truth in the idea that the modern understanding of the enormous size, for example, and age of the universe that um, Dr. Wiseman has um, shown us so beautifully um, is actually in contrast with the outlook of the biblical writers. The contrast is often overdrawn by the anti-theists for their own rhetorical purposes, but there is a contrast. But what I don't concede for a moment, though, is that the progress in scientific understanding implies that the Bible is somehow wrong uh, in what it seeks or sought to convey. It didn't uh, aim to convey a modern scientific description of the world. It seeks to convey insight into the character of the creator, our relationship to him, and the way that that relationship can be brought back into harmony through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, okay then. Uh, the interpretation of the word has been adjusted because of our knowledge of the works. But also, a big part of what are often intellectual tensions that currently exist between the word and the works arises from the other side, from misinterpretation of the works. What I mean is this. Science can provide us with an understanding of the regularities of the universe, the way that God upholds it by his word of power, Hebrews 11, in its normal workings. Um, but to suppose that having a natural explanation of some phenomenon rules out God as its source, source or author is not science, it is mistaken metaphysics. It's misinterpretation, if you like, of the works, imagining them to be saying something that they're not. And unfortunately, some Christian teachers or preachers um, are led into this scientistic attitude. And when that happens, Christians um, um, make the problems worse. Um, by accepting the metaphysical misinterpretation and consequently thinking that they must oppose the scientific findings themselves in order to maintain uh, their Christian commitment. And this, I believe, is what underlies the anti-science attitudes 
that argue against an old earth or against natural selection. And I think that we Christians need a, a deeper and perhaps a humbler uh, faith so, uh, so that we can accept that there may be unresolved interpretive puzzles arising from science, from the works, um, but we can nevertheless rest secure in him whom we have come to know through his personal as well as his intellectual self-revelation. So the challenge today that I think um, the science that uh, Dr. Wiseman has so wonderfully put before us and for our uh, ministry to the world is to grow in a true understanding of the reality of God through a balanced attention to the word and to the works. And it's been my delight um, to be present for Dr. Wiseman's masterful exposition of the wonder and integrity of God's works. And we, God's people, should value the book, both books, more highly. We should recognize that and be confident that God is present in the astronomy's observatory, even if it's an orbiting observatory, as much as he is in the theologian's pulpit. Thank you so much for your talk.